Welcome. Thank you. Glad you came. On behalf of the uh, uh, Slatington uh, Historical Preservation Committee, uh, hopefully you learned something today. Uh, what's going on here, I'll just take a few minutes, is uh, we wrote a book, this committee, and we called it, uh, uh, in 2014, we called it the More History About Slatington. We had done one in 1989. So we came back and did this one, and when we did, people said, when they got the 2014, they said, oh, I never got a 1989 book. <laughs> okay. So they asked us to reprint the 89 book, uh, which we took orders and we did. So after that happened, then our committee got together. Incidentally, our committee is on the, I guess the back of that uh, brochure. It's my wife, Judy, who's president. She couldn't be here today, so she asked me to fill in. So any of you that are married know you don't have a choice, you know. So, so I'm filling in. I'm a vice. I'm a vice president. Uh, our other vice president is ill. That is Candice. Uh, we have a secretary, Mike Hoffman, to my right, and we have a treasurer, uh, Robert Stetner. It's also to my right. Uh, doing the video business. Uh, so we decided, uh, I think it was Robert's suggestion, he had seen and we had heard about cemetery walks for history purposes. I think I heightened it one and I think uh, Judy and I were at one in uh, Jim Thorpe. So we said, oh, okay, let's do one. See uh, if, it draw, if it brings out people, if they're interested in the town history. And then we also uh, I think it was Candace suggested, why don't we do one up at Fairview, because that's where most of the slate barons are buried. So for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, uh, Slatington from the 1700s to the 1800s was farmland. And who owned it? Kern. Nicholas Kern and his family. So they owned it. They bought the land from the Penn people and the, they owned it. Then in the 1800s, early mid 1800s, what did they find here? They found slate. Welsh Town Road, 1835. Uh, you're close, yep. That's all kinds of dates around when they first found slate, but the tunnel quarry, which is Brian's ancestors were involved in a quarry that's still on Welsh Town Road off to the right there, and they build a factory there, and so forth. So anyway, they found slate, but first they found it over across the river in Northampton County, and uh, in Lehigh Township. That's where it was found first. But then they found it up here, and then all the Welshmen came across in their boats, and all the Scotch-Irish came across in their boat, and they wanted to make more money. And so. This little town of nobody, which it was called different names, it wasn't always called Slatington. It was called uh, uh, Waverly. It was called Kern's Mills, because Kern had a grist mill, he had a sawmill, he had a different. And so they changed the name to Slatington, and all of a sudden there were churches and there were uh, banks and there were stores. And we're going to talk about the two guys that really were responsible for this. Uh, I got the one of them, and someone else is going to talk about the other one up there. But we'll talk about them a little bit later on. So all of a sudden, Slatington is booming, and they're digging and mining for sleep. So, Slate Barons. So we're going to talk about six, seven, eight sleep barons. And don't get mad if one of your ancestors is not included in that list, because there's a whole list of them. My ancestors, although they weren't wealthy and they weren't slate barons, were Evanses. Now, if you have Evanses in your front shop, 
you know they were very, very prominent. And Thomases, and Griffith, and Roberts, and they're all over this cemetery uh, because it was uh, called the Welsh Cemetery. And when I was growing up, it was called the Welsh Presbyterian Cemetery because 90% of these people that are buried here went to the Presbyterian Church, either the First Presbyterian, which no longer stands behind the statue uh, up Upper Main Street in the corner, or the Salem Presbyterian Church, which still stands uh, back on 4th Street. And uh, Robert's going to... Uh, uh, Robert, Brian's going to tell you a little bit about their cemeteries and uh, and cemeteries, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about uh, one of these barons and uh, I guess I'm done. On, oh, we thought we might do. If we got a good turnout, and this is a good turnout in my eyes, I don't know what you guys think, but uh, if we got a good turnout, we might do one or two a year. And maybe we'll do a union. Now, <laughs> we won't do slate barons over a union. We'll do farming barons probably or something like that. But, uh, and we might do slate ale, and we might do uh, freightings, and we might do some of the other uh, quarries. Uh, another one is not standing Heidelberg. Heidelberg. That's very big. That's where people got buried. My my wife's ancestors, and maybe mine, are out there because that was real. Well, they had the church, and that's where people got buried. Heidelberg and Ness. Those are two very big ones. I read that. That was the first one around here. It could have been. Could have been. There were five original churches around here, and one of them was Heidelberg, the other one was uh, Nutripoli, and there were a lot of original. Okay, I think I'm done talking to you about the introduction. Now we will move on, and this gentleman named Brian Reed, the tallest fella here. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, a lot of you heard about his dad who recently passed away, Clem Reed, and Brian now takes care of the cemetery here. I think, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think gratis. And uh, so he puts a lot of time in cutting the grass, digging the, getting the graves, stuff, and so forth. So uh, he's the guy that you get in contact So I'm Brian Reed. Uh, my interest in, I'm from Sladington my whole life, and uh, my interest in here, it came because of uh, my great-great-grandfather, his name is Owen Jones, and Tim kind of referred to it, was the first one that discovered slate in Sladington in 1845. And some of these guys can correct me to perfect, I think there was a Roberts guy, but he was the first one to find it on this side of the uh, Lehigh River. And it's with Wellstown that Tim referred to, on Wellstown Road, the tunnel there. And then uh, his his daughter, he found it in 1845, and I believe he went over like the next year or something and brought his family over, and his daughter's buried down in the, in the center of this section over here. So from there, uh, he, uh, they, she had, there's several sons, but one of the sons then uh, of hers would be my grandfather and then uh, my my mother so it's all on my mother's side and my mother's buried down there and of course my dad died last year but uh so on my mother's side so my my uncle wasn't my mother's brother uh it was just the two of them he was secretary treasurer for a number of years and president over the years and so forth and then uh along the way he had passed away he passed away in 55 and i was born 61 so i never knew him but uh I guess he asked his son-in-law, which would be my dad, to be involved, and my dad uh, didn't want to be involved in the t at the time. But then later on, as years went by, uh, he did get involved, and uh, they had had some financial problems where the, the money just didn't stretch to take care of it, and he kind of got it back on track. 
And uh, so my dad then was, was president and there was a board for, for many, many years. They, well, they always had a board. Uh, now we don't have anything right now. There's no, not much interest. Hopefully I can rejuvenate that. And uh, so I kind of grew into it. So as a kid, they'd bring me up here and drop me off here. <laughs> and, and I thought maybe there'd be some guys, there's a lot of people, it's amazing, you bump into that are from Slayton that as kids did weed whack, or, or well not weed whack back then, but trim around the stones and so forth. And I don't see any of them that are here. I mean, there is somebody, I don't know. But uh, years ago, when, when, when I started, and I've, I'd say, I, I don't know, 57, so like 45 years that I've been up here. Uh, we used to trim with, we had these, these lawn mowers that were just narrow mowers with three wheels on them, two in the back and one in the front, and you'd go around and push from stone to stone, and going up these hills it was a pain, and somebody else would cut the grass ahead, and if they cut too far ahead or rain or whatever and you didn't catch up, you'd see these tracks going through because you'd push them. Now it came a long ways with these weed whackers, uh, tr tremendously. <laughs> and, uh, but even to weed whack this, it takes uh, about 23 hours to weed whack the whole thing. And a zero turn, before the zero turn, we just had a, a tractor, four wheel tractor, John Deere, which we still had down there. And, uh, and that would take around 23, 25 hours. Now with a zero turn, I can do it in around nine hours. That, that cut it way in half. So that was a big plus there. And then to, to go between the stones, where, the, where this little three-wheel thing that you'd push around with to go between where it didn't fit, then they had a, uh, a radiator hose on the handlebar, and, and they put a set of trimmers in the kind, and you go like this, and then you'd go between there. So I did that as a kid. So I kind of <laughs> kind of grew up with it. Then over the years, there was people that we, we found that would, they'd always get paid, whoever would cut the grass here. Um, we'd find people to work on it, and uh, kept going that way. Right now, these last two years, I haven't had anybody too much, so I'm kind of like this morning, I was up here, I was, my, I, I take some pride into it, and like Memorial Day, I always make sure it looks real good, and, and of course, we have the services here every other year, the union has them the other year, so we try to make a good look for Memorial Day, and the rest of the time, but this year, as you all know, if you have yards, it's just hard to keep up with, it's just unbelievable. So that's kind of some of how I get into this, uh, but there's a map here, well, first of all, you know, like, like Tim said, 1845, or I said, I guess, but the tunnel quarry was like the first thing, and then all these other people came over, which they're going to talk about. And uh, that tunnel quarry, uh, Robert McDowell, which had owned the land here, uh, he bought a third interest into that tunnel quarry. So he was right from the beginning, too, which, to whatever talking about that, we can put more to it. So uh, my understanding is that... Uh, he had owned the land here, and it was a farm, and I guess they needed a cemetery. Um, the First Presbyterian Church on Main Street in Slayton, where he said the, for the fireman statue in the high rise is now, uh, there was supposed to be, my understanding is, there was supposed to be a, a cemetery in the back there of that church, and there was one over on 4th Street by the other Welsh church, and there were some other churches there. I'm not sure you can right or wrong if I'm right, but anyway. I was always told that some of those people from the First Presbyterian Church in the back were moved up here, and I was always told there's some flat ones by the center tree there in the center of the section. There's a bunch of flat stones there, and that was my understanding. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't 100% know. But uh, that they were moved from there up to here. And then we have this map here that's setting over there that's interesting to see. That's 1880, whatever. No, not, well, no, the, not they got, you got the plot, but the one from 1880. That one there. 1882 that I just brought up has uh, the cemetery on it. Uh, it's a really neat map to look at if you're interested in, in history of Slanton. And uh, it has a cemetery up here just like in the midst of a farm kind of thing. So I guess it started in, I, I forget the date, 1880, 82 or, or some, somewhere in the 80s. So it started back then anyway and then kept going all this time. Uh, in 1905 uh, it was incorporated. McDowell had owned it and I believe the family had owned it, and then uh, uh, his heirs had it for a period of time, and then uh, they incorporated. He died. McDowell died in seventy eight, eighteen seventy eight, and then by nineteen oh five it was incorporated. And I have the first stock certificate here that was given to my dad, a, a guy that was instrumental. Well, let's back up a generation, but he's buried right on the other side of his, right by to the left of the tree. Uh, the big oak tree right here. His name's Dr. Uh, Campbell, Luther Campbell. 
and he had a son so anyway he was the first shareholder there is what I have the first share and his son was an accountant and they still had the accounting firm uh, cry it's Campbell Rappold and Uratus or something down on Cedar Crest and uh, Campbell was the f one of the founders of that firm if not the founder I'm not quite sure but he was the accountant so for years he did the bookkeeping on the cemetery because he had an interest in it and he's buried straight up the road here straight ahead he got a plot so his father's there and he's up here and uh, we, as a kid we used to go to his house for things related to the cemetery and so one day he thought that I guess my dad more so than me because I was young then should have the first share so I have the first share that was issued back then and all these prominent people that are in the four corners here all were shareholders plus many more but where all those shares got I don't know so it's it's uh, it's just an association well, he so has, excuse me, he has some of the original shares which he brought here that has them. yeah yeah some are marked return they returned them so why, so i don't know why they were returned yeah or, they were cancel or return or whatever and you never hear anything about that it's that but originally they would have had ownership and they had it in their bylaws that to be a director on the board you had to own a lot and a share so to get a somebody to be a director on a board they'd, they'd make sure they had a lot in a, in a share so some but then when they were done or whatever they they returned them and they're just more canceled in the book there well, maybe Ryan so, wants to take your money if you have some extra money. For yeah. He'll take your money. Yeah, we, we could we cares. could we could use money here. That's that's the one thing about a cemetery. A cemetery's got to go on forever and ever and ever and ever, and uh, so it's a, it's a hard thing to keep up with. These, especially when you get in an old cemetery like this, and we get we we get maybe 20 funerals a year, roughly, and half of those are cremations. Uh, so you might get 20, but all these people that are here, you know, they were selling lots. When I look back at like, you know, five, ten dollars a lot, and the perpetual care was just pennies, 25 cents, and so forth. So that money just doesn't cut it over all these years to push a lawnmower over, and, and, and you know, even the gas now, it, it costs you 60 bucks just in gas just to cut every time you cut at least. So we're just trying to stretch it and keep it going as best we can. I don't know what else I can. What did I skip that we talked about? I don't know. Well, you did skip. Did I? I figured I did. I think you said I should. I figured it did. Well, you didn't want to. But yeah, I don't. This, yeah, this, yeah. Is that this? Yeah, that's that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's your last name? Reed. R E E D. Yeah, if you would have kept living here, uh, you would know him. I would know that. You wouldn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> the Reeds own half of No, me. no, 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 no. That's no, not true. No, 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 no. I'm saying that. Okay, this is something I dug off the archives online, and uh, Brian said, you do it, Tim, you do it. Uh, this fellow, Myron Ware, who's very active in the, was very active in the Lee County Historical Society, uh, uh, typed up and wrote this thing about uh, a burial, and he says that there's a lot of burials that no one knows about. They don't know where their ancestors are buried. And, Etc. Etc. But he says he hopes that someday uh, people get their records together. But here he, I thought this was interesting. He says legend has it that for many years a suicide victim could not be buried in a church cemetery, and an individual recorded as so sudden death actually was suicide. So if you ever saw or read somewhere. Uh, someone died of, of sudden death uh, that could have been suicide uh, but it was listed that band was listed and we he says we noticed a number of reinterments in Lynn Township uh, so anyway that's what Myron Ware had to say about uh, burials but I, but I want to say one thing well we'll get into this uh, Brian told you where people were buried. Presbyterian Church, Presbyterian Church. Somebody said, oh, the Heidelberg Church has a lot of burials, and they do. And Neff does, and they do. And Friedens does, and they do. These big old church cemeteries have a lot of them. But when the, when the Welsh came here, and the Presbyterians came here, they said, we want to get buried here, not out in Lynn Township or Heidelberg Township where the where the Dutchies are. We want to be here with uh, with the Welsh. So uh, 
And the Kern. Where's Mr. Kern? He's here. There's Mr. There Kern. <laughs> the Kerns are accused of having their own private cemeteries. <laughs> now, they had a lot of land, 500 acres, Nicholas Kern purchased originally, and he sold that or gave that to his kids and grandkids and everything. And there, they are supposed to have buried a number of their descendants on the on the farm line between here and Emerald, mainly along Trout Creek. Well, what happened was the uh, the slate people, the slate baron, said, "We want to dig a quarry here." There's slate there, so they dug a whole lot of quarries along Trout Creek between here, Emerald, Slate Ale, etc., and they dug up these so-called these so-called Kern uh, cemeteries. So I just want to add that yeah, that's about cool. yeah. burials. Yes? Uh, what about uh, the cemetery on Bucktown Road? The Williamstown. Well, you mean at Williamstown? Williamstown, yeah. yeah. A, a fellow by the name of Henry Williams. He was a, what's the church down there on, on the Second and Baptist. Baptist. The Baptist, Baptist the church. Baptist. Henry Williams came over and he was a Baptist, Anabaptist, whatever an Anabaptist was, uh, I don't know. But he he built a, a small church at, at, uh, at the Williamstown there. And uh, he dug a big quarry. I don't know, those of you that are old enough might remember in the bend, there was a big deep quarry there. And that was called the Williams Quarry, the Henry Williams Quarry. And he also built a church, and he built a cemetery. And there's still an old cemetery inside of walls there, where a lot of Henry Williams, he's buried there, and a lot of his descendants are buried there too. So the main, the main difference there is that was originally a Baptist cemetery, Presbyterian. Well, that's true, Mike. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the history book. Uh, William Michael, he wrote a lot of that information. Mm. Well, I thought Michael wrote about trolleys, yeah. railroads, yeah. and uh, and uh, what else? No, Mil military. Military, yeah, that was. Yeah, thing. and and. And he did Billy, a good job. And Billy Michael has a plot up here. His, in fact, his mother-in-law is buried, and he'll be buried up on the top here. So he Someone got an interest. Died in the interest in, I saw recently. I don't know. Yeah. There, as far as the names too, you'll see, which is a little maybe different than over at Union because they're all Welsh, but they're all Robert. When when you look through the book, when there's always somebody calling up wants to know their ancestries. I have one, two this week that I didn't get back to. One was from Idaho and one's from Minnesota. But anyway, they want to know something, and and like Joneses or Roberts or Williamses, and I mean it, it's you go through lists and lists and lists. They're all those Welsh names like that. And then I guess I don't know. I've heard this whether this is true, but like uh, if it was. Owen Jones, or maybe that's not a good one, but uh, well, Ro they Robert Jones, they, they would the they would flip yeah, their yeah they would flip an article they, where they change the names they just flip them they'd flip them like Robert Griffiths Griffiths Robert yeah generated. like that yeah they just flip the names over so they, they'd flip them after so often so it's it's kind of hard to find check them but there's when you go through Joneses there's a ton of them Robertses there's a ton of them Williamses there's a ton of them. But you take Morris, there's tons of Morrises up here. Yeah, there's some Morrises. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Tons of them. Yeah. And yeah. You know, you've run out of your questions. Here. <laughs> 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 I didn't know you when I came. <laughs> <laughs> now you're sorry you know me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You keep it for next Where time. Where you <laughs> Come say keep coming to Eastern Pennsylvania, Wallingford, and all the people in the world. I think on? they're leaving. <laughs> they're what? all leaving, as far as I. I'm going to California to see my relatives and to see my wife's relatives. So they didn't stay. They left. They went out to the. I met a person from the Netherlands, and I had my dog with me, and she promised me to groom that dog for nothing. So I gave her a watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> and 
Sorry, bro. That's okay. Are you done? I guess. I don't know. What else you can Any questions for Brian? edge me to say if I skipped anything, but... So if you want to get buried on Fairview, he's the guy. <laughs> yep, yep, we'll sell you a plot. Yep. Well, up in Alaska... You remember, he remember, here. you remember now. Up in Alaska, they take their own trenches, and their loved ones are... In Germany, they only go so deep, then they go on top, then they go on top. We've been over there tracing to these relatives. They, they don't have room. They got to bury on top. What? One thing about this cemetery, as far as that, which is different from some others when you get around, uh, it's all, well, we got slate here, but we got a lot of shale, so almost all, of, well, this whole cemetery is all shale when we dig, so it's, it's kind of good in respect that it's not clay and stuff that when you're laying in the ground there that the water's damp and seeking around you. So it's, it's a good place to be buried. It's high. They call it the ferry because you can see the gap up there. You can see the airport from here when the leaves are down. It, it's really a nice view. But, uh, but it's all shale. Uh, his question about why people came here, I, at least in my own case, and uh, you know, it's Robert, so it's Welsh folks. Yeah. And I know they came because my great-great-grandfather uh, splits shingles Slate. In, yeah. in Snowdonia. In, I can never say it. San Barris, I can't pronounce the double L, uh, in Wales and ended up here when he when he came to this country yeah. and ended up in by the end of his life uh, they had a couple of holes here well apparently we were progressing we had industry after industry that's on steel everything that's what robert mcdowell you might have heard of that name Oh, you might have heard of the street that was named after him in town. They dropped the MC. What's that street? Dowell Street. Okay. Robert McDowell was of Scotch-Irish heritage. I'm not sure why. I looked it up several times, but I don't know why. For some reason, politically, in Scotland, they had turmoil, so they moved over to Ireland. And so they called those people Scotch-Irish. And so Robert McDowell and an uncle and a brother, I think, came to America. They were slate people. They had a little money. And they moved into a section over near Bath, which is called, or was called, the Irish Settlement. Oh, that sounds like that's a, a good name. It was also called Craig's Settlement. Craig's was a Scotch-Irish name. And you know, Craig's also had, or maybe you know, Craig's had up the Lea Gap. They had a store, they had a different uh, enterprises, a hotel going on there. They're all torn down. So anyway, uh, so then Robert McDowell came over to, came over to uh, the Irish settlement near Bath. And he was in, with relatives, he was in the quarry. Then he heard about these quarries up here near Sladington. Oh, maybe I can make some more money, he thought. So he came up, first he though settled in uh, over there at uh, Lehigh Township. Then he came over. And uh, originally the bridge wasn't built, but they the, uh, built the bridge. And uh, then he found several quarries, and he found a slate processing company. So, now, if I'm wrong here, just you experts correct me. Lehigh Slate, and they, uh, he was uh, superintendent and treasurer. And the building still stands. If you go downtown, and make the bend and uh, continue and continue on Factory Street. You know where Factory Street is? Okay, continue down on Factory Street. On the right hand side is where, what's the oil man that had his, Mance. what? Mance. Mance. Mance, he kept his trucks. And uh, now I guess his uh, heirs have the, the business there, oil and coal or whatever. But that building, 
This is the same building that uh, McDowell used. Uh, after McDowell, the Bachman brothers, Bachman family, took that over. Uh, so, McDowell, if I had to, whatever, whatever my opinions were, if I had to give you my opinion of who is a number one and two men in the founding of Slatington, he'd be right there in one and two. The other one, you're going to hear the next speaker talk about up the road here, it's a fellow by the name of, guess what, Jones. That shouldn't be so hard to fathom. We got a lot of Joneses here. Uh, Welsh, of course, where he's Scotch Irish. Uh, so he came over here, he found Slate, uh, he brought all his kids, he was married, and all his kids were born down in the uh, settlement, in the Irish settlement. They brought him here, and he made lots of money, he built lots of houses, he built for his family five houses. And uh, only one, two are standing yet. At the statue, that one sits back, that was for Nancy, his daughter, and across the street where Dr. Torby was. That he built for another daughter who married Dish. Uh, so anyway, he built a lot of houses, and they built banks, and they built stores, oh, it just went on. All of a sudden, Slate, they went from 100 or so up to 2,000 people, all because of Slate. And uh, so this is uh, McDowell, Scotch-Irish name. Uh, here are, they have separate ones for his, uh, him, his wife, brother, he had a brother. Here's a, Here's a, here's a question for you. You can walk out of here a lot wealthier than you came, okay? I'm gonna give you a chance to make some money. This, he had a son named Robert Murray McDowell, okay? He's over here on this side. R. Murray, only son of of uh, Robert and Sarah, 1850 to 1890. Okay, I've been tracing him. I'm just, I'm just a crazy genealogist trying to figure out uh, something about his wife. He married a young girl from Brooklyn by the name of Stella Lilliendahl. They moved into the father's mansion, and they had two daughters. I found one of the daughters, in fact, she's, her husband's here. The other daughter I can't find. But do you know, I cannot find Stella. I have gone through the Slady the News obituaries at the library hundreds of times. I can't find Stella. So if you know how to find Stella McDowell, Stella Lillian Doll McDowell, uh, let me know. There's got to be a reward there, because my wife will pay you a reward. She's tired of me looking and complaining that I can't find Stella. Okay, enough of that. Uh, and these are all descendants of, uh, of Robert McDowell, or he has a nephew up there, George McDowell. Spelled it a little different, but they took the, some of the plots here. And uh, they have some kids down here too. So. Robert has this all. Uh, Brian, how did they divide up plots? Help me out here. You can see between plots, there's a row. Yeah. 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 So there's a lot of open plots here. So if you know anybody, if you know Brian or any McDowell descendants, you might be able to get a plot here. So uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, that is McDowell. Any questions? Yeah, I, I'm curious. I, I take it he was one of the first. Yes. To, to 1811 to 1878, and he probably started developing in the 1840s or something like that. Okay. So here, but here, here, like I was saying, my great great grandfather discovered the first lady tunnel court. I read where he he bought a third interest into that. There was a Roberts, 
and and he bought a third interest. Yeah, I did read that too. That was 1845, so I think that was like the start of. All right. Uh, so Slayton Slay, Slay was 1864, right, Robert? Yeah. 1864. So we're quite early here, and but here's my question. I I didn't grow up here, but I had relatives here. And when we visited, it was always, I, I was not allowed to go near bed bug. <laughs> and I never did. So I was You bored. missed out on half the fun this lady did. Yeah, well, uh, I had a stick to First Street, that was it. Uh, at any rate, when I- First started, Street, well the bed bug was right no, down the hill. I know, that's why I wasn't allowed to go down there. <laughs> at any rate, um, when I then saw the marker years later for, for Bedbug Cave, I discovered something that I never dreamed of, that they tunneled. Oh yeah, they had a couple then, tunnels. So here's my question. Well, according to that marker, they named it after the avenues New York, in, in Fifth New York Avenue City. And it Empire must have Lake. been yeah. very extensive. Well, they used to call Manhattan Quarry. They right. used to, yep. Yeah. So my question is this. Did they tunnel first? Was it all those tunnels? And when when that got too expensive? I think it was tunneling down, first. That's what I think. Exactly. Maybe they were coincided, but I well, think it well, was. 1845 the tunnel car. That's the first. That was a tunnel, and it's still right. still there. It, it went it went in the side of the town on yeah. Road. It goes in the side, yeah. and then it just goes up. If you go in there, you, I was in there as a kid. It, it just goes straight up into the hillside that they dug, and then down it's water, but they dug down. My understanding is on the on the bed bug was. All those, uh, they went in, they dug, dug a hole, and then they put all that, well, I don't know what they did the first hole, but anyway, then they dug another one, and they took that stuff when they dug it out, the, the rubbish stuff that wasn't slate quality, right. you know, blackboard quality or whatever, they put it in the other hole and, and flipped around like that. But, but I uh, talked to old no timers, older than me, believe it or not, that used to go in there and play they snuck in, not like you, they didn't listen. They snuck in there and there was a water, like a lake or a pond in there. And there was a boat and they would get in the boat and they would row the boat out as far as they could go. And they, uh, then there's all kinds of stories. If you ask the old timers if they're living yet, where did, the, where did that quarry bed bell end? Oh, it ended under the light at Main. Oh, it went up to uh, Victory Park. Oh, it went over to there. So, <laughs> there, there's there's a uh, I guess you call it YouTube or Facebook, whatever. There's a guy that went in YouTube, last year. Yes. YouTube, is that what it was? Yes. I, I'd love to see when he comes. I'd like to be there when he comes the next time. But he went in it last year, I believe it was. I saw it. Did Chris, it last year? Christy's the one that told ago, me about yeah. it. And uh, yeah, he he went in so far and said this is worth coming back for. Yeah. <laughs> with you to be prepared because he yeah. found the water. He found the lake. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, can everybody hear me? I'm Susan Kern, just call me Susie if you have a question. If you have a question, go ahead and ask it during this. <laughs> Daniel Dreas Jones, okay? You've heard a little bit about him already. He was born in Philadelphia in 1827, so he was one of the only people that we're talking about today that was born in the United States. Um, orphaned at the age of nine and taken in by a farmer in Bucks County. Uh, he moved to Bethlehem at the age of 15. Tim knows his stuff, I gotta read this stuff. Uh, he began to learn his trade of carpentry. A lot of these slave people were carpenters. 1849, he moved to California to mine gold and the captain of a steamship on the Sacramento River. He wasn't there long. He must have struck gold. He came back to Bethlehem before finding his way up here to Slayton and befriending Robert McDowell. They were good friends. Through his friendship with Robert McDowell, he invested heavily in land and the early slate quarries. So let's talk about this uh, land investments, okay? So we've heard some of this before. Slate was found in Slayton in the latter part of 1845 by William Roberts and Owen Jones. These two Welshmen, um, they found it on the property of uh, Jonas Kern. Jonas Kern was now the patriarch of the Kern family. He was a great grandson of Nicholas, okay? Nicholas was the founding father of Slatington. Kerns were downtown. A dozen years later, the Romales came uptown. So these Welshmen, found this quarry on Walshtown Road, and we know where that quarry is. That's the first tunnel quarry, and that's how they mined in Wales. That's what Pete Pape told me, the tunnel quarries. Um, and asked the Kearns if they'd sell them the land around there so they could mine this um, slate, and they says, uh, yeah, no. We said, we're not gonna do that to you. But um, Jonas Kern, who was, like I said, the patriarch, 
He says, I'll lease it to you, although the rest of the Kearns, they wanted nothing to do with this. They didn't trust these Walshmen. They were digging holes. We're farmers. They were farmers and millers for 100 years, so we don't want nothing to do with that. But Jonah said, listen, we're sitting on all this land. They own north to the Gap, east to the river. They own all along Trout Creek. They own up to uh, the Romali land holdings, which went around to Washington Street in Slanton. We're going to lease these people some land. So they leased it. Uh, they made a 15-year lease. Um, and that guaranteed the Kearns, not just Jonas, but all the Kearns, uh, 28 cents for every ton of manufactured slate that came out of that Walsh Town Quarry. Plus, they got all the slate that wasn't fit to use a slate, slate for the uh, roofing slates. That's what the main thing was in the beginning for roofing slates. Then came the mantles and uh, blackboards. The first uh, blackboard was over here in Freedens. So that was the deal. Uh, now what they got out of it, what these Walshmen got out, out of it, is if, if the Kearns wanted to quarry any uh, slate, they had to include McDowell and uh, Roberts. Is that yeah, McDowell and Roberts? No, Roberts and Jones, Owen Jones, I'm sorry, I got that mixed up. So that was the deal. And so a year and a half later, they found Slate again in the hillside of the Dan Jones Hill. If you're from Slanton, it's called the Danny, named after Dee Dee Jones. And uh, they did another lease and they mined their Slate out of there. And for the next couple of years, two, three years, four years or so, uh, that's how it worked. More quarries were open now. These were these pit quarries. For some reason, I don't know why they changed, but uh, until around 1850, all along Trout Creek. Until 1850, something happened, and I don't know what, but the Kearns started thinking maybe there's something to this slating industry, and maybe we're going to sell some of this land off to them. Now, I know they built their grist mill. At, if you're from Slate, you remember the big grist mill at the bottom of the curve? It was tucked right in the curve. Maybe they wanted money for that. Maybe that's why they built it. They had money from these land holdings. I don't know. But the first land he sold was 24 acres to Robert McDowell, who Tim just talked about. And this is in Upper Slayton. Um, the thing about this land sale was, this, the sale was in October of 1850. The Kearns just sowed that with wheat, wheat seed. So the, the deal was, no, you don't get the land until this wheat is grown and cut. And that was in August of the following year, 1851. So as soon as that wheat was cut and out of there, the first, uh, uh, stakes went in the ground, and that's when the first buildings were built uptown. Um, within oh, not too long at all, Dee Dee Jones got involved with this with his good friend McDowell, and they bought up all the land uptown, up to the Romali, up to the Romali uh, um, land holdings. And so what they did after that is they started divvying these lands up in the lots, like Timmy said, and they started selling them. And that's when Slanton grew from just those few families. You had the Kearns downtown. Henry Coons was there. He married a Kern. Robert McDowell wiggled his way in there somehow. And uptown you had the Romales. It went from those families to 2,000 people in 20 years till 1869. Okay. And, and another reason they, sold, they agreed to sell the land is now the Kearns were working in these slate quarries too. Okay, so that was uh, 1851. Now I'm guessing that since they divvied up the lots, for homes, they probably also put in the roads. That's, I'm guessing that. I never read that anywhere. But if they did, I'm guessing they, they uh, named them too. So you had all the roads going north and south numerical. First Street, Second Street, Third Street, which was the widest, which was Main Street. And then Fourth Street and Fifth Street, there was no Sixth and Seventh yet. And then all the roads that went east and west, they'd name them after whatever, like every town does. They'd name them after presidents. You had Washington Street. They'd name them after uh, Famous people, Ben Franklin, Franklin Street, every town has these streets. They might name them uh, where they are, North Street, South Street. They might name them because there was a bunch of churches on them at that time, Church Street. And they threw in a couple of their own names. You had McDowell's, like they said, became Dow Street. And uh, poor Dee Dee Jones didn't get a whole street named after him, but he got a hillside anyway, the, the Dan Jones Hill, the Danny. If you're from Slanton and you say, you know where the Danny's at. Okay. Any questions yet? Or shouldn't I ask that? <laughs> okay. Daniel Jones owned and operated several slate quarries, including the Blue Vein, the Kern, the Penlin, and the Franklin. And these quarries were on the west side of town along Trout Creek. And it was a small hamlet that grew out there. And it was another name that was called in Slanton. That was Jonesville, not the Jonesville that we heard about down in uh, Central America. Jones served the Civil War from 1861 and 1863. And when he came home from the war, he left right off where he, where he started in his business uh, interest. He helped establish the town's first waterworks and was the town's first postmaster. Uh, now, it's, it's, it's and, and Timmy uh, hit on that, the first uh, post office was in Slanton, for Slanton anyway, but before that you had to go up to the Gap, up to this Craig store, which also served as the, the uh, post office. So now once Slate was discovered, 
uh, there was so much mail and so much business going on in Slayton that um, the department, of, the postal department in Washington decided now it's time to put a post office in Slatington here. And so that's what they did. Mail would come in on the train, which would go from Philly to Jim Thorpe at 10 o'clock at night, and then come back and pick up the mail at two o'clock in the morning. And the first year, the post office made $50. That was their take. And Jonesy got half of it. So that was a good deal. Okay. Jones served as the town's first and third Burgess, which they call mayors or mayors now. He served as a councilman, school board director, and was the first president of the Diamonds and Savings Bank. That was Slayton's first bank. <clears throat> in 1876, Jones contributed greatly to the pres preservation of the history of Slayton with his 4th of July address, printed in the Slayton News. There was even a Slayton News back then, which provided us with much of the early history of our town and the discovery of Slayton in this area. That's where a lot of the information in books that I read came from, from his memory. So if his memory is no good, you know, that's why you have so many different dates about when did the Kearns get here, when did the Romales get here. Daniel married S. Jenny Mott in 1867 and built their large home on the corner of First and Church Street. They had six children, three who survived. And that's it. Yeah. I'm, I'm new to the area. What is the name of the creek you keep mentioning? Trout Creek. Trout Creek. Trout, okay. Trout Creek. Okay. We had another name for it when we were kids, but I can't say that. Yeah. When the surge flowed into it. <laughs> yes. The Danny is, you go down the street and you're gonna go down a real steep hill. If you go straight, that's the Danny. That's the Jan, and his, you make a left, that's the Dan Jones Hill. Well, when they were built, there were 100, there were wood. Now they're like 97. 92. How many? 92. 92, yeah. They were, they were wood at first. The mantle quarry. Oh, no, the Welsh Town? I've never read anything other than the Welsh Town quarry. Yeah, it could be. It was the only one. Okay. Okay, next up we have the Morgan family, and I'm sticking to a script here. I'm not going to ad lib too much, so bear with me. Uh, we're in front of William Morgan's grave, but the patriarch is down there, which you can see after we have the roper. Uh, the family patriarch of today's featured Morgan family was John Morgan, 1808 to 1885. John was born in Scotland, like you've heard some of the other uh, slate barons today, and emigrated to America with his family in 1855. He lived in Slatington for six years, moved to Ohio to try his luck with farming, and like some people even today, they somehow find themselves ending up back in Slatington. And John, come on, we all know people that said they were never coming back and did. Uh, and John did too as he became active in the local slate operations. John married Susan Black, and they had two sons, William and John. Not much is known about his role in the local slate industry, and the emphasis on the rest of my presentation will focus on his second son and grandchildren. His first son, William, 1831 to 1898, was born in Scotland, and after coming to America, he became a slate contractor who employed 40 men. After serving in the Civil War, William became active in politics, served on borough council, and eventually became Burgess. He was also active in the Presbyterian Church. We've heard that theme before. William married Margaret Marshall, and they had seven children. Three of his children, Alexander, Alfred, and W. Wallace, were all active in the slate industry. Wallace, 1870 to 1913, became a prominent businessman who advanced himself in the slate industry. He married Ella Kern, daughter of Thomas Kern of the Kern Lumber Company fame, and they had two children. Wallace started as a clerk and bookkeeper for AP Berlin in the Washington Slate Company, and also in the Provident Slate Company. Wallace later became treasurer and director of the Washington Slate Quarry. The Washington Quarry was one of the largest quarry operations in the area, employing 75 men in 1897. The quarry was located a half mile west of the Lehigh Valley Railroad Depot along Trout Creek. The quarry was started in 1851 by Robert McDowell and had a value of $40,000 back in 1868. Together with his brothers Alfred and Alexander, he started the Star Slate Company. The Star Quarry was located one and, one and three quarters miles west of Lehigh Valley Depot along Trout Creek. Wallace also served as a clerk's obsession in the Presbyterian Church around the time of his death. 
During this time, the church had 225 members. Alexander, 1867 to 1943, and his wife Annie had four children and, as stated previously, was involved in forming the Star Slate Company. Alfred, 1875 to 1944, was a school teacher and later assistant principal in Slatington. He was also a member of the school board and became school board president. In addition to his involvement with the Star Slate Company, later he and his two brothers associated themselves with the Washington Slate Company. Alfred was secretary and business manager of the company. After leaving the slate industry, he became an insurance agent. Alfred married Jenny Roper, daughter of Dee Dee Roper, another one of today's slate barons. They had two daughters, Evelyn and May, and some of you may recognize the name Evelyn Morgan, who was a Latin teacher and librarian for 45 years at Slatington High School. John Morgan Jr., 1836 to 1906, the second son of John and Susan Morgan, was born in Scotland and came to America with his parents in 1855 at the age of 16. During the Civil War, he enlisted in the 146th Regiment, Pennsylvania Volunteers, and served until the end of the war, attaining the rank of sergeant. After the war, John returned home and he was employed as a salesman for the Lehigh Slate Company and then worked as a bookkeeper in its slate office. He then went into the general merchandise business with David McKenna, who was son-in-law of Robert McDowell, from 1870 to 1875. John and other businessmen purchased a large farm west of Slatington along Trout Creek, known as the Kern Farm Slate Property. The property contained six large profitable slate quarries, and John was considered the owner and organizer of this venture. John Morgan Jr. was involved in another enterprise that benefited all borough residents, and one that is still used by the borough and its citizens today. In 1884, the town's water supply then sourced from springs originally owned by the Romali family at the southern end of town, was becoming too small and unreliable for a rapidly growing town. There was an excellent supply of spring water at the base of the Blue Mountain on the Joshua Dorward farm. Nine public spirited and progressive individuals decided to purchase this 21 acre farm. Some of these names you may recognize. Besides Morgan, there was Thomas Kern, Louis C. Smith, J.D. E. Mack, David Williams, D.D. D. Roper, Samuel Kasky, R.H. Dol uh, Dolby, and David McKenna. The spring on the Dorward farm was enlarged. Two large reservoirs were constructed, each having a, a capacity of around 250,000 gallons, and two iron mains two miles in length were laid along Welshtown Road into the borough, one from each reservoir. Described by an author in, in an article about Slatington 1891, Slatington became, he said, the possessor of a water supply equal in quality to any on earth. Of course, these springs, reservoirs, and transport system are still used today, some 127 years later. John became affiliated with another one of today's featured slate baron, Sam Caskey, and together they ran Morgan and Caskey Dry Goods. In 1894, Morgan sold his business to A.P. Steckland Company, but remained with them in the position of bookkeeper for five years. Following his departure as bookkeeper, Morgan then entered in the real estate business, which occupied him until the time of his death. John was a member of the Republican Party, served on borough council for 12 years, and he also served on the Slatington School Board for a total of 16 years, holding the offices of treasurer and president. Like many of today's featured slate barons, Jan John was of the Presbyterian faith and served as a church elder for many years. John was also a longtime member of the Slatington Masonic Lodge. There he attained the title of Master Mason and served as treasurer of the lodge for 23 years. Morgan was also a, a member of the Masonic Commandery in Allentown. Effie Long of Easton was his wife and together they had nine children. All told, the Morgan family of Slatington made a lasting legacy in the local slate industry, Presbyterian church, local politics, and Slatington school system. Any questions? All right, everyone, we are now going to talk about David Williams, who is buried right here, as I'm standing on him, um, and his brother Owen, who is buried right across the road here. These brothers were two of the most prominent and successful slate producers in Slatington and Walnutport following Robert McDowell and D.D. D. Jones. David Williams was born in 1823 in Bethesda, North Wales, and died in 1893. He came to America when he was 19, along with his brother, Owen, whose tombstone, I said, is directly across the road there. 
The Williams brothers initially farmed and then used their money to, and skills to purchase and work slate quarries in Walnutport and Lehigh Township. Remember, we said quarrying starts on the other side of the river and then comes to Slatington. Um, they originally started at the Heimbach Quarry, which is in the vicinity of Kmart today. David originally had his farm at that location, and that uh, area was originally uh, was later used as a water reservoir for Walnutport. After David moved to Slatington, he developed several quarries downtown with the name of Riverside, which was north of Main Street along the railroad tracks, along with a large slate manufacturing plant between the railroad and Williams Island. As you would imagine, Williams Island was named after these brothers. Okay. This was in the area of where Sal's Pizza is located today. Okay. Williams Island, we said, was named after them and includes the piece of land that is currently home to Riverside Auto, Tri-County Team Sales, and Domino's Pizza. We had this nice painting here looking from Slatington over to Walnutport. We have the covered bridges and right in the area of these buildings is what is now Williams Island. Sal's Pizza would be located right off of the photo there. Just across the street on Williams Island also was on the right side of the street as you go into Walnutport and I believe Robert said there was a picnic grove there in our meeting the other week, correct Robert? Yes, picnic grove, okay. In the early slating <laughs> the early Slatington business, which included the quarry and school slate factory, started as a partnership between two strong-willed men, Mr. Williams and a man by the name of Mr. Fulmer, who was a capitalist from Easton. These are recollections from David Williams' grandson, also named David. An inevitable impasse was reached in due time and the business was divided. The Easton man took the quarry and Williams took the factory. Williams' choice proved the wiser, and he incurred the hatred of his former partner. This story continues. When David Williams built his home in Lower Slatington, the Easton man built a multi-story hotel, which is called the Arlington Hotel, alongside it to shut out the view and breezes. <laughs> he left, apparently left the hotel stand idle for 20 or more years. Then, David Williams had enough of this Easton guy, he wants to move, so he moves across the river to Lehigh Township. When he buys land in Lehigh Township, the Easton man follows him, buys the adjoining land, and opened a quarry in such a way that water from it would be drained into the Williams Quarry, but this did not succeed. When David Williams won the court's approval to construct a dam in the arm of the Lehigh River, which flowed past his factory, Again, the Easton man started to dump his quarry refuse in the stream to shut off the water flow. Again, David Williams succeeded in stopping him. As you would imagine, there were legal battles back and forth between Fulmer and Williams. Often, David Williams would have to harness a horse and carriage at three or four in the morning and drive into Easton in order to be there when the courthouse opened so as to get a head start on the Easton man in the legal battles that were fought between them. So the two homes that he built were on Lower Main Street, one of which he lived in before his daughter, yes, this is her name, Cinderella, took over ownership and another for his son, Llewellyn. He also built two homes on Center Street for his son, James and Walter. His daughter, Alavesta, married Louis Brensinger and they lived in Allentown and also used the farm in Lehigh Township as a summer home. Cinderella married Samuel Rosebury, who was a businessman in Slatington. His sons are buried here, and his daughters are buried over on Union Cemetery. Away from the slate operations, just like many of these other slate barons, Williams was involved in other interests. He owned a store downtown named Williams and Brensinger, and also a machine shop. He served as Burgess and held postal, church, and school positions. His sons, James, Walter, Llewellyn, and his son-in-law, Louis Brensinger, continued to operate his other businesses after he passed. So that was David Williams. Now to talk a little bit about the brother, Owen. 
Owen Williams dates 1812 to 1884, continued to work in quarries around Walnutport and Lehigh Township, especially in Danielsville. Other slate operators there were, well, they had the last names of Hauer, Henry, Daniels, Caskey, and Emac. At one time, he owned much of the land in Walnutport from Main Street south to New Street. He built five twin homes along Main Street for his five daughters. He also owned the Slate Exchange Hotel, which is the site now occupied by Diamond Fire Company near the, near the railroad tracks. Many of the other lots were given to family or sold to others. He married Mary Jones and they had 10 children. And when he died, Owen had 31 grandchildren. Does anyone have any questions on the Williamses? And actually, I have a question. Maybe Robert, maybe Tim will know. William Street, this family? William Street in town? In town, From this family. Yep. Avenue and Wallaford. Different. Owen. Owen. Uh, no. Okay. So, 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 so you have both brothers have um, streets named after them, both in Sladington and Walnutport. Okay. Any, any hint as to the nature of that humdinger of the argument that the. I, I have to imagine it all came back to the business practice and when they had, to, oh, you're saying this, the, what came like to the separation. Um, <laughs> this was all from recollections that Tim uh, his grand, his came up. His grandson wrote these recollections and they had a lot of other stuff, but I just gave Michael. Yeah, there was, I, we didn't, I didn't get a chance to pour over them like Tim did. Um, but I have to imagine in there somewhere, you said there were many, many pages of these recollections. Um, so we don't know though. Some type of business relationship. Yes, yeah. No. I'll tell you, I did a lot of research for my 80, for 1989 book on this guy. And, uh, and I gave some of it to uh, Michael. But this guy was loaded, let me tell you. He was loaded. You know, you don't build five houses. And well, a great factory and, uh, and other factories and this and that. And you don't have a pump. To, you know, you know he, this guy was loaded. <coughs> And speaking to Tim's statement there, I think looking at the grave site here is proof enough of that, yeah. right? Well, then you he know. sold that to Fulmer, didn't he, Robert? I believe so, He yeah. sold that factory to Fulmer, and it yep. burned down. Oh, so that was, so was that the... Okay, well, there you go. There's your answer. There you go. Okay, if there's no other questions, we're going to... Yes? could have been a homicide of the end. Was Slatington ever a, a company town? Not like Palmerton. You know, where, where Palmerton, you had um, the zinc company, and the zinc company owned the whole land, and they plotted out and built the bungalow houses and all that. Slatington was much more, um, the factories and, and so forth popped up. Um, it, it wasn't a, the factory town where you had to buy your goods at the factory store or anything like that. How many quarries are around Sladington in England? Now? Yeah. Working? No. no, no. How many holes are in yeah. the ground? Yeah. Over a hundred. Oh, over a hundred. Over a hundred plus. One, one working quarry, right? One. one. I heard, I read that every individual Quarry was owned by a different person, oh. and that's how he reaped his income. I own several farms. Yeah. Some people own several. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Alrighty. Okay. We're talking about David D. Roper. The odd thing about this to start right off is his tombstone says Daniel D. Roper. I don't know where that came from. I talked to Tim about it. I checked all the books. It's always David D. Roper. They never tell you what the middle D's for, but this is David D. Roper. Uh, and as you're hearing, as we talk here, these guys not only were enslaved, but they were involved with everything. They were involved with all the churches, you know, the waterworks, everything like, and this guy was no different. Okay, 
prominent lawyer, slate operator, born in Ireland, Monaghan County, attended schools in Ireland, emigrated to America around 17, along with his brother John. He be, uh, afterwards, he began, began under the apprenticeship of Eli Bosenberry for the purpose of learning carpentry, another carpenter, and this was in New Jersey. Young David enlisted in the Civil War September 5, 1862. He was in the Civil War for nine uh, months, got shot in the leg, uh, and that bullet stayed with him the rest of his life after being insisted in his leg. Roper's carpentry skills were in such demand that after his discharge after the fall of 1863, he was earning $10 a day, which allowed him to further his education in the Allentown Collegiate Academy from 1864 to 1866. In 1866, he entered the law offices of Edwin Albright. We talk about this. Back then, you needed two years for anything, to be a lawyer, a doctor, um, a minister, teacher. and a teacher. teacher. And there's a fellow who was in Wallaport that was all four. That would be Reverend J.J. J. 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 Wrights, right? He was all four. Did you know what he was, Brenda? Right. At Stone House up on Gap Road. Oh, okay. Yeah. By 1866, he entered the law offices of Edwin Albright, and by 1868, he moved into Slayton, established him now with the law offices of Henry Kuntz, who was Slayton's Justice of the Peace. During the early stages of his practices, from 1870 to 1875, he became identified as the editor of the local uh, Slayton News, which was at that time being printed in the Kuntz building, but I don't really know where that's at. I like to track down these early buildings where that, but I've never did find that. In 1875, Florida, what's here. it? <laughs> I'll check down there. <laughs> Let me take these off. In 1875, Mr. Roper was one of the leaders in establishing the National Bank of Slanton, serving as its director and bank solicitor until he died in 1904. Uh, that bank was located just north of today's post office, uh, but it's not the bank that we remember as kids. We remember the American bank. It was the one before that was the old dime savings uh, bank, which was the first one in Slanton, built in 1869. The bank we remember was uh, 1902. Roper served as school director in the local schools, served in the National Guard for four years. He represented Lehigh County and the state legislator for three terms. That's the first time that ever happened. He was instrumental in the establishment of the waterworks. The guy was never home. And a leader in the establishment of Slayton's Rolling Mill. Now the Rolling Mill was down uh, on South Walnut Street, what is now um, property of Orkin. Everybody knows where Orkin steel is. And it's one of the very few businesses, big large scale businesses, that really failed. I would say it failed. Uh, in 1890, his purpose was producing iron bars, which couldn't compete with the steel products. It just couldn't compete. Uh, they were made for chains, fire escapes, horseshoes, hatchets, things like that. They tried to convert their mill, I read, to a steel mill, but that didn't work with that, that kind of machinery. So it, it failed. A couple times it failed. As an experienced builder, R Roper supervised the erection of the Slayton Presbyterian Church, another Presbyterian complete what is originally the 120 foot steeple. This was in 1876, the same year he built his uh, home at 210 Second Street. Do we know where that's at? It's the large home, now it's blue, but if you're between uh, Church Street and Franklin Street going up the street, it's a big blue one that sets back. Yeah, it has the two, it has the two turrets. That, the home wasn't like that when it was built, it was just a regular two story home. I don't know what when he uh, enlarged it, but he enlarged it. It was 20-some rooms in the end, put two turrets on the sides and added a third floor. Yeah. He was a carpenter. Other names associated with building at that Presbyterian church were McDowell, LaBar, Caskey, and Jones. Those are all slave people, and we've heard a couple of them. We'll hear about Caskey soon. Uh, it's interesting to note also that these churches, these old churches that were built in town uh, that are still standing today were built during Slayton's heyday. I always consider the heyday from the absolute heyday from 1880 to the beginning of World War I. Uh, and it was built by these businessmen, these slate operators who were very uh, generous. And they were mostly paid off before they ever heard of whole, uh, held a service in it. They had money, a lot of millionaires in town. It wasn't until after 1893, after everything else that he did, that he became involved uh, in the slating industry with the Rice Brothers, that was Samuel and A.I. Their joint venture was organizing the Haz Hazel Dell Slate Company, which was outside of Emerald, and they got the name from, it was in a dell, which is like a low marshy area, and uh, Hazel was a bush, the bushes that were growing all around there. Uh, becoming superintendent and relying on his 25 years of practicing law, uh, this venture which dealt, again, strictly with uh, roofing slates, was the town, one of the town's largest and most profitable. They say that about every slate, Corey, if you hear this. Uh, it reached out to all parts of the United States and foreign countries, and that's true because Slayton, uh, don't let anybody tell you different, especially those banger people, was the slate capital of the world. 
Rober married Amy Kernahan in 1876, and they had five children, Vida, Jenny, Minnie, Winfield, and Mame, or Mamie, I'm not sure how that's pronounced. It was Jenny and Minnie who had children that became well known to the people of Slayton. Uh, we just touched on Jenny Roper married Alfred Morgan, who had two daughters, Evelyn, longtime respected teacher. She was a librarian when we were in school. Minnie married Dr. Charles Mushlitz of Slayton. Uh, they had two children, Robert and Phyllis. Dr. Robert was a physician and ophthalmologist here in Slayton. When I was a kid, Pop would take me up the street to Dr. Robert. He was to get my eyes examined and my head maybe. Uh, and they lived, and the, that was in what is now the Bechtel home in Slayton. Um, Phyllis married Dr. Marvin Thomas, a dentist here in town, and they lived right down the road here at the top of the 100 steps that we talked about. Uh, Phyllis was priceless. She, she's gone now. She was a great source of information, sharp right until the end. She told me so many stories. It's nice to know the dates and the buildings and where they are and who built them. She told you stories. She told me that um, Max Hess would come to Slayton. Max Hess, the original Max Hess, that became Hess Brothers, right? The largest store probably in, on the eastern seaboard, maybe close. Um, and she would come to he would come to Slanton and he'd bring Max Jr. Um, he would come to Slanton because he married a Slanton girl who lived in where it is now Harding's funeral home. So he'd come up here in the summertime, and this is this is Phyllis had told me that, and he liked to come to Slanton because he blended in. He was a millionaire, but there are a lot of millionaires in town, and he liked to. So he'd go to the country bars, and nobody would bother him. And young Max Jr. would play with Robert who became Dr. Robert. She also told me a story about when the original Lincoln Building burned down, how it burned down on Donut Day. I mean, you know, who else would know that? There was nobody else around. <laughs> David D. Roper died in June 27, 1904, at 2.30 in the afternoon in his home after weeks of heart and lung failure. And that's it. Any questions about D. D. Roper? We got Samuel we got Alexander, okay? Samuel and Alexander Kasky. These gentlemen were from Ireland, okay? Some numerous fortunes struck the Kasky family when they were in Ireland. Samuel was 10, so this is 1840, and Alexander was four when their father died, and their mother had to move the family back to her own town in Scotland. It was a very personal tragedy for them that they had to be uprooted. Samuel was born in 1830 and died 1914, worked as a farmhand and plaster apprentice in Scotland before he sailed to America at the age of 19 in 1852. The following year, Samuel and his wife, Agnes Carr, moved to Ohio, where they met David McKenna. McKenna convinced Samuel to return to Slatington, where he eventually became the superintendent of Lehigh Slate Quarry. The Lehigh Slate Company, I'm sorry. He later became very prosperous running his own quarries, including the Heimbach, which I discussed earlier with the Williams, and Washington. He took on John Emac. We've heard that Emac name a couple of times today. That's the same gentleman. On as a partner, and uh, Samuel also operated a paving business with his brother. Lastly, he went into a dry goods and grocery business with John Morgan, like Robert said, and the store was named Morgan and Caskey, located on Uptown Main Street. They had, Samuel and Agnes had six children, Mary, who married Hugh Roberts, William, who continued as superintendent of the Heimbach Quarry and lived in Walnutport, David, who was a salesman and became mayor of McKeesport, Rebecca, who married John Strasburger, Louise, who married Horace Harper, who Horace Harper's father, Henry Webster Harper, also operated slate quarries over in the Berlinsville area, and Hugh, who married Esther Hawkins. During his residence in Slatington, he was elected Burgess for several consecutive terms. Prior to that office, he served as borough councilman, secretary, and treasurer. He was one of the most active members of the, of the Presbyterian Church, and he served on their consistory and was a Sunday school superintendent. Samuel died October 5, 1914, of an illness with gangrene after he amp both legs were amputated. He was one of Slayton's oldest and most prominent wealthy citizens at that time of his death. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk over to Alexander. Alexander, who's right here with the flag, he was born in 1839 
died 1903 and followed his brother Samuel to America at age 17 in 1857 along with their mother Jane and their siblings Susan, William, and Robert. They sailed for six weeks in a fishing boat and Alexander became very sick. He said later in his life that he would never cross the ocean again until a bridge was built. <laughs> he originally worked for his brother, but later they joined forces and operated quarries together. They built adjoining homes on Main Street and Walnut Port to be closer to their operation of the Heimbach Quarry. They sold the land across the street uh, on Main Street for the Walnut Port Reformed Church, which is today Christ UCC, in 1903. Alexander married Magdalena Polly Heine, and some of their children died young, but they did have eight surviving children. Some of those young children you can see are buried here. Those that survived were Elizabeth, Samuel, Sally, Susanna, Joseph, Magdalene, George, and Anna. Five years after his arrival in the United States, Alexander was drafted to serve in the Civil War, and you can see that with the flag there. While working with his brother in the paving business, heavy list lifting caused stomach pain for 15 years. An autopsy later showed he had an aneurysm of his aorta, which caused a blocking of his opening to his stomach. It caused him to receive less and less food as he went on, and ultimately he passed away um, because um, he starved to death. And he died when he was 64 years old. He raised his children in the strictest manner of pure Presbyterianism. This included family worship, grace at meals, children's catechism, attendance at worship services, and a very strict observance of the Sabbath. There were no games on Sunday, no picnics, and even the swing was thrown up into the limb of a tree, lest it be a temptation to a weak-willed child. <laughs> He was a past member of the Slatington Lodge of Freemasons and at the time of his death was visited weekly by his fellow Masons. Many members of the extended Caskey family, just like the other um, Slate Barons, are buried here on Fairview Cemetery, including both Alexander and Samuel's mother and their siblings. Does anyone have any questions? Hello. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. You say the original slate was um, dug out by in tunnels? That's, yes, that's, yeah. Were these miners that were doing, well, considered miners that were doing this, or what? Quarrymen, right? You would, you would just, yeah. We would just call them quarrymen, I guess, yeah. So you had, in, in, a, in a slate business, vast majority of the people who lived in Slatington, if they were not involved in um, farming, would go to work and be a slate quarryman. Um, I know I had a couple ancestors who did a little bit of both, um, but that's that's how it was. Yeah. Okay, so slate is your quarryman, no matter how you get it out. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Any other questions? If not, we have one more stop, and this stop just might be the most interesting of them all, okay? A man of influence in the Slatington community, progressive and enterprising, winning and retaining the confidence and esteem of all with whom he is brought in contact. No, I'm not talking about Christy Haight. Is he still here? He left. He's right, right in front of me. Those words were used to describe James Lewis Foote. I know we're gathered around Arafoot's grave, but we'll get to that later. Arguably, his influence and leadership came at the peak of the local slate industry, the time from the late 19th and early 20th centuries up until the beginning of World War I, which is kind of what you said, Christy, the heyday of Slatington. Foote was a native of Salisbury in Merrimack County, New Hampshire, born April 15, 1856, although his parents were originally from Massachusetts. After studying law, Foote opened up a practice in Manchester, New Hampshire in 1877. On February 4, 1879, he married Arietta L. Platt, who also lived in Manchester. Foote didn't care for being an attorney, so after four years, he moved to New York City, where he became engaged in the mercantile business. 
While there, Foot became aware of the great prospects in the burgeoning slate industry in Lehigh County, Pennsylvania, and moved to Slatington on March 1st, 1887. Foote's first foray into the slate industry came as an employee of Henry Kuntz, Esquire, proprietor of the Slatington Slate Company, which we heard a little bit about earlier, I believe with ropers. Foote held the positions of bookkeeper and sales manager for six years. He then became associated with enterprising individuals who formed the Bangor Slatington Slate Syndicate for the manufacture and distribution of roofing slate and slate blackboards. Now there's a whole other story here about lawsuits with the other gentleman that Foote was involved with, but it's too complicated and I'm not going to get into it. So just know that there were some issues just like the Williams and Fulmer. Foote eventually became the syndicate's general manager. For two decades under his tutelage, the syndicate grew, extending its reach across the length and breadth of the United States as well as many foreign countries. Mr. Foote came to be recognized as the best known person connected with the slate industry in the United States by reason of his well-conducted, persistent, and judicious advertising. The Slate Syndicate advertised its products in building, trade, and manufacturing catalogs. One such ad from 1912 began by stating, we are located in the center of the largest slate producing region in the world, a section 10 miles long and three miles wide, embracing nearly 100 quarries. We are connected with no association and no one can fix prices for us. The syndicate promoted slate shingles, which were a registered trademark called SBS Extra Unfading Black. Some of the well, well, more well-known brands of slate that the syndicate sold were American Banger, Pennsylvania Queen, Star Union, and Old Reliable Big Bed. By 1895, the syndicate shipped products from more than 19 quarries in the Slatington region, 14 in Northampton County, and from the best Peach Bottom and Vermont quarries. 1895 was a banner year for slate production. In an interview in a trade magazine, Foote noted that shipment of roofing slates were the largest ever known, 150,000 squares or 3,500 carloads. Over 1 million square feet of blackboards and 35,000 square feet of school slates had been shipped that year. In an article describing the syndicate, it said they have unequaled facilities for the shipment of all orders and can procure unlimited quantities of slate. In case you're wondering, a square of slate refers to the amount of slate that will cover 100 square feet. So you guys can do the math on some of those figures I just gave you. Lots of slate. On August 17, 1895, the largest shipment of roofing slate ever made in America, a solid train of 37 cars was prepared by the syndicate. The train was 1,380 feet long and was pulled by two engines. The total weight of the slate was over 1 million pounds and totaled nearly 2,000 squares. Foote personally directed the makeup of the train and supervised the work of decorating the train cars. The shipment was destined for 10 states. On each car was placed a muslin streamer that read, Roofing Slate Shipped by the Slatington Banger Slate Syndicate, Slatington, Pennsylvania. This was another example of Foote's shrewd marketing and advertising. An article in the Bethlehem News noted that special efforts were made to have this train noticed by the press of the important towns and cities through which it passed. An article in the March 11, 1898 edition of the Reading Eagle said slate operators here are in touch with every leading American city, nearly every European capital, and as far south as New Zealand. The value of exported slate rose from $40,000 in 1895 to nearly $1 million in 1897 in only two years' time. A year-long strike at the largest slate quarry in Wales gave the Americans inroads in the European market. Foote was quoted as saying, we gained such a strong foothold and established such an excellent reputation for American slate that London, Liverpool, Glasgow, Dublin, Paris, Berlin, Vienna, and many other leading European markets are still taking American slate. Foote began a bi-monthly publication in 1908 devoted to an advancement and promotion of what else? slate. In trade journals, the publication was described as a clever little house organ of the syndicate and altogether a snappy little paper. Foote's first wife, Ara, whose tombstone were gathered around today, died in 1907. Inter excuse me, interestingly, Foote got remarried the next year to a former schoolmate of his, also from New Hampshire, Sarah Emmer Emma Blanchard Raleigh. Even more peculiar is that Sarah's first husband also died in 1907. Less than a year later, they rekindled 
I can turn my page. They rekindled their youthful, their attraction to each other, and hooked up. <laughs> Sarah was a direct lineal descendant of Sir Walter Raleigh, the famed English poet, explorer, and politician. As I wind down, I will give you a quick list of just some of the dozen organizations that Foote was involved in to give you an idea of how active a role Foote played in other facets of Sladington's business and community life. Foote was one of the organizers of Christ Episcopal Church, which is uptown, uh, well not uptown, but it's at the intersection of Diamond and William Street going towards the high school. He was one of the speakers at the dedication for Sladington's fireman statue in 1910 and served as master of ceremonies. He was also passionate about the cause of education and filled the office of school director for three years, serving as secretary and president during his tenure. And lastly, he was president and one of the organizers of the Citizens National Bank. Foote died on July 23, 1914 at the age of 58 after